This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 340 was recorded on September 8th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Energy markets expert and noted keynote speaker Dr. Anas Alhaji returns as this week's feature interview guest, and I think you're really going to love this interview. I'll start by asking Anas to critique and sanity check my own admittedly extreme call that the world is inextricably stuck in the very early stages of a global energy crisis that will change the course of history. Then we'll discuss the role of the petrodollar system and what the implications would be if other nations settled oil trades in currencies other than the U.S. dollar. We'll also discuss the Russian crude price cap proposal and why it can't possibly work. Then be sure to stay tuned for our postgame segment when I'm going to make an even bolder market call than our January 30th, 2020 alert that a global pandemic was probably coming. After that, Patrick's chart deck will be titled Current Intermarket Landscape. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Eric, let's jump to that S&P 500. I mean, we went through about two solid weeks of settling down toward 3,900, but we're getting a little bit of a bounce. What's your thinking on the markets? Do you think there's more downside from here? Yeah, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. And you're right about the bounce. I don't really understand why the bounce is happening, because frankly, I think we're seeing more and more confirmations that there has never been, well, not never, but there has not in recent weeks been any sane reason for people to continue to expect an imminent Fed dovish pivot, given the data. The only logical reason to expect a dovish pivot was the expectation that inflation was coming under control. And what we're seeing is the exact opposite. So I'm amazed that it's still this orderly and civilized. And I think that every uh, little rally here is a gift, frankly. Europe's problems are eventually going to spread to the United States and the rest of the world soon enough. And we'll explain why in this week's feature interview with Anas Alhaji. We're looking into both a very serious imminent global recession and a formative global energy and food crisis. There's no good news anywhere, and inflation and bond yields are looking worse by the day. I don't understand why it hasn't happened yet, but I think all the ingredients are here for a crash. And I mean a real crash, not the orderly sell-off that we've been seeing so far. Now, I want to qualify that and say, hey, uh, you know, the market's not doing what I've been expecting it to doing. So maybe I'm out of touch here, but that's the way I see it. All right. Well, let's move on to that U.S. dollar index. Uh, what a rip. I mean, I have some charts I want to show in the post game, but uh, the dollar trend continues. A little bit of a reversal yesterday, but uh, nothing to, uh, to be alarming in terms of the primary uptrend. Do you think it keeps going? Oh, I do think it keeps going. And I think the question is, how high can the dollar go before it blows up a whole bunch of other things in the global economy? And are we going to need another Plaza Accord type of global intervention? I think it's almost a certainty that it's coming at some point. The questions are, number one, how long it takes before policymakers take action. But then also, how long does it take before market participants start anticipating and front running that action? So it'll be interesting to see. All right. Well, let's uh, touch on crude oil. It uh, seemed to be bouncing off that $85 support for even a month, just coming back down. And suddenly uh, yesterday we got an, uh, a breakdown. We traded all the way down towards the 81 handle. Do you think uh, there's more selling to come here on the short term anyway? Well, Patrick, because this week's feature interview is crude oil focused, I don't want to steal Anas Alhaji's thunder, so to speak. So I'm going to focus on this week's news and inventory data, and I'm going to save my own market outlook until after the feature interview with Dr. Anas Alhaji. EIA crude oil inventory came in with a massive build of 8.8 million barrels. 
Now, that's really only about a 1.3 million barrel bill because 7.5 million of that came out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which again is at its lowest level since 1984. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 501,000 barrels. Gasoline building half a million barrels. Distillates building 95,000 barrels. U.S. production holding steady at 12.1 million barrels. Tape action, the panic spike down, of course, had to happen in reaction to that 8.8 million barrel massive, massive crude oil build. That lasted all of about 30 seconds before it retraced higher. So I think big picture what's going on here is that huge sell-off that we had yesterday was probably the market anticipating this big build. And it looks like we're at least trying to retrace back up to maybe the five-day moving average. Is there still more downside to come from here? It's entirely possible. With respect to whether there's more downside to come from here, let's save that until after the interview with Anna Sahaji. In the news this week, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline shutdown has finally been uh, acknowledged by Russia to be indefinite rather than just temporary. Now, remember when I said months ago that Putin was not likely to weaponize access to energy or in the summertime and he's more likely to wait till about the 1st of October? Well, I was wrong. I was off by a month. European Union leaders sprang into emergency action over the weekend and developed a comprehensive, aggressive plan of action, which I am confident will succeed at making the problem dramatically worse. We have the ECB fighting hard to tighten financial conditions to squash demand, while economic genius Liz Truss simultaneously drafts plans for handouts to ease the pain and make it easier to pay the bills. We've got different parts of the government working against each other, undermining one another's efforts. A lot of people have asked why these huge swings in volatility, what's going on? The answer is that speculative liquidity has basically dried up in crude oil markets. Now, remember, the purpose of commodity futures markets is to provide a vehicle that allows hedgers to transfer unwanted market risk to speculators. So you've always got hedgers that have to hedge. And if an uh, oil producer needs to hedge their future production and needs to sell a few thousand contracts, under normal conditions, there's plenty of speculators ready to be on the other side of that trade. When the speculative participation dries up and somebody needs to hedge just a few thousand contracts, there's nobody to sell it to. And all of the sudden, the market swings were going five or even ten dollars in a day when it used to be that five or ten dollars took six months for the market to go that far. The reason is because little events are causing really big price swings due to a lack of open interest and speculator participation. Maybe Joe Biden and, and Liz Truss will get together and propose an outlaw on speculation to solve this problem. Let's see what happens. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, quickly touch on gold. Uh, we seem to uh, at least be uh, holding the previous lows at the short term, but uh, the trend certainly hasn't turned up yet. Uh, what's your thinking on gold here? No, it sure hasn't. And, you know, given everything that's going on in the world and the uh, geopolitical escalations and threats and so forth, the fact that it's doing this poorly really concerns me. And what we saw today is, yeah, we had a bump up there, got right up exactly touching the 13-day moving average at 1738, and then starting to reverse. Now, the 13 is the highest of the three short-term moving averages, so that touch is a perfect uh, you know, textbook counter trend bounce that probably is not going anywhere. If we saw gold move above 1758, the 21 day moving average, then I'd maybe start to get a little bit more excited about this turning bullish. But frankly, right now, I'm just uh, waiting for the shoe to drop. If I look at the volume profile chart, we're right at the kind of the bottom edge of a high volume area. If we start to drop too much further, we could see a big acceleration to the downside. All right, and let's uh, touch on that 10-year Treasury yield, which uh, is uh, just north of three and a quarter. And I mean, we're a stone throw away from that June high, and uh, clearly bonds are uh, acting uh, quite bearishly, almost even arguably more bearish than uh, the equities are behaving right here. What's your take? And I think that's maybe because the bond market's smarter than the equity market. Uh, remember when I said that if it goes over 3% again and it stays there, it means inflation isn't really ending. And most importantly, the Fed pivot isn't really imminent the way almost everyone assumes it is. Well, bingo, that's what's happening. Well, this week's feature interview guest is crude oil expert and keynote speaker, Dr. Anas Alhaji. Eric, why did we get Dr. Alhaji back on the show this week? 
Well, Patrick, I've been making some really bold market calls lately, saying that we are in the very early stages of a global energy crisis and probably also a global food crisis that will change the course of history. And quite frankly, I've been holding back on some of my strongest conviction views because I feel a certain sense of responsibility not to express an extreme view with profound consequences on a public podcast until I have the opportunity to run it past some bona fide industry experts who know a lot more about the subject than I do, so that I'm not just wildly speculating about something that I'm not truly an expert in. For example, when I decided on January 28th of 2020 that we were going to make a pandemic prediction call on the January 30th, 2020 show, we did a double interview and got Dr. Chris Martinson on so that somebody with a PhD in a related field could weigh in rather than me just expressing my amateur opinion. And that's the reason for the recent concentration of natural resource-related episodes with Adam Rosenschwag, Lee Gehring, and now Dr. Anas Alhaji. So before making any more dire predictions on the air, I wanted to get a true energy markets expert with much greater experience and credentials than myself to weigh in. Now, spoiler alert, Anas is basically going to tell me at the beginning of this interview that I have it all wrong and he's going to set me straight on what's really going on. So those of you who just salivate over the chance to see me proven wrong about something can get ready for a dopamine hit. But then put your seatbelts on for what Anas has to say next. Well, Eric's interview with Dr. Anas uh, Haji is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after his message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Dr. Anas Alhaji, former chief economist for NGP, Energy Capital Management, which for anyone who's not familiar, is the premier private equity fund in the oil and gas space, and former professor from the Colorado School of Mines, the University of Oklahoma, and Ohio Northern University. Honest, it is great to have you back on the show. It has been too long, and boy, we are overdue for a crude oil special. It's great to have you back. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to start by syncing up. We talked a lot about this last time, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this subject. Anybody who's interested, who didn't catch your last interview, should go back and listen to that one because it's as relevant as it uh, was the day it was recorded. But I want to just kind of follow up on our last interview. After that interview and watching what's happened in the market, I have become convinced that the world is in a global energy crisis. And I'm going to make a, a, a bolder statement than we made in that last interview. I'm going to say that although the recession may hide this, and it might be years before people really figure this out, I do not believe that it is possible for the world to return to pre-pandemic normal in the sense of uh, energy demand going back to where it should be naturally, you know, if, we, if the normal growth path had continued and there hadn't been any pandemic. I make the argument that it is not possible to get there because the energy supply needed to do that simply does not exist. And furthermore, in order to solve that problem would take several years because you'd have to start making much more investment in new oil and gas production. And I think we have a really, really serious problem. Everybody's talking about this European energy crisis. I don't think there is a European energy crisis. I think that Europe just happens to be feeling it the hardest and what's in Europe now is going to get worse. And I think it's coming to the rest of the world. 
Am I missing something? Because that's a pretty strong statement that there's no way out. Yes, missing. You are missing something, but the other way. The crisis is ten times worse. Oh, it's worse yes, than I ten think. Ten times <laughs> worse than what you think. That's uh, not well, possible because <laughs> I think it's really, 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 l- let really bad. Let me explain bad. quickly since we already covered part of this in the last interview. But let me explain quickly where things are going and why I am very bullish on, on oil and specifically uh, bullish on natural gas and LNG, even coal. The issue here is that, yes, we, have, we don't have enough investment in oil and gas in, in the last seven years. We have lack of investment, and there are many reasons for that decline in investment. But the big story of the future, regardless of the current story, regardless of the current crisis, regardless whether we are going to have a recession or not, the problem we are having is the failure of the green policies. And the failure of the green policies, by default, will increase the demand for oil, gas, and coal. And that demand is not counted in any outlook that exists today. None. So where that oil and gas and coal is going to come from, we, d- we already we don't have an inv- investment for the current outlook, but the demand is going to be way higher, so the gap is going to be very large. Would you agree with me that one of the risks here is that we're probably already headed into a global recession, but we could get stuck in it in the sense that as we begin to recover from recession, that means oil demand goes up. That means price goes up. And I think it's going to go up so much that the increase in the cost of energy could create, I'll call it a recession trap, sort of like a liquidity trap. Once you're in it, you can't get out of it because the process to get out of it is to increase demand. And as soon as you do that, you cripple the economy with too much energy cost. Uh, Do you think that that's a possibility that we get into a recession that maybe even turns into depression because energy is the gating factor that keeps us stuck there? One of my fears, since we live in the United States, one of my fears is if you look at Europe and the conservation measures they have today, where they are asking people to have cold showers and to change the thermostat and do this and do this and do this and do this, I am afraid that's going to happen in the United States. And if it's going to happen here in Texas, we just had two months of temperatures above 100, which means there is no way you can, you cannot be outside. And if you cannot turn on the air conditioning, people are going to die, literally. With the 107 in Arizona, it was 112 the other day, people are going to die. So my fear is our lifestyle is going to change completely for a long time. So it's not only about the recession. It's about our lifestyle that we enjoy. We are going to be just like third world countries, but we are going to suffer more because in third world countries, they're already used to what they have. We are not used to it. We have a generation right now which is the most privileged generation on earth. And you are going to tell them, sorry, we don't have power, so you cannot play with your phone and you cannot play your games on the computer and you cannot do this and you cannot do this. Can you imagine what's going to happen? I mean, people are already complaining about the mental health problems. So the issue is way larger than a recession. We are talking about health issues. We are talking about lifestyle. We are talking about everything related to the the Western civilization as we knew it. Well, Anas, you are shocking me because, frankly, I didn't think there was anyone on Earth who's more concerned about this than I am, and it sounds like you may be. But let me try one last uh, volley to to one-up you before we move on to some other subjects. A lot of people think that I'm nuts for saying that this is just the beginning. I think that Vladimir Putin is very astutely running a chess game where So far, everybody thinks that the only thing he's willing to withhold from the global market is Nord Stream 1 gas to Europe, which, uh, of course, has been shut down this week, and and Russia has announced that it will remain down indefinitely. Nobody seems to be making the very obvious connection that if he's willing to lose the revenue and withhold the gas from Europe, he's probably willing to withhold oil as well. And as we get into a very tight physical market situation... My contention is that we may get to a point where Putin realizes, hey, I could take half of Russia's oil off of the market intentionally. That would force the market to double the price of oil. I'd get the same revenue, and I would be using taking our oil, a Russian oil, off of the market as a tool 
of resource warfare, to wage war instead of nuclear weapons. And I think we're headed toward a global resource war where uh, eventually, basically all the people that have predicted that a finite planet would eventually reach its limit with uh, too much population growth and so forth, I think that big moment, the, the so-called peak oil moment, is here. We are already in the seventh round of sanctions on Russia right now. Seventh, which means that the first one, second one, etc., all of those failed. And the reason why they failed, because it is very clear to Western leaders that they cannot push Putin to the corner. They cannot corner him. Because if they corner him, the price is going to be exactly what you said. So that's why the sanctions were a joke. This reminds me of the cash 22 that the Biden administration got stuck into. I'm going to mention two examples how they got stuck. The only way to negotiate with Iran is to turn the blind eye to the sanctions. And the Iranians, well, no one is punishing me. No one is doing anything. Why I have to go for a deal? That's number one. The second example is President Trump put the Houthis in Yemen on the terrorism list. Then President Biden came in and removed them from the terrorism list. Why? Because the only way to negotiate with them is to remove them because no one in the United States, even government officials, are allowed to meet with any terrorist under the terrorism law. So the only way to do it is to, to lift them from the terrorism list. And once you remove them from the terrorism list, why they have to negotiate with you now? So we have exactly the same situation right now with Putin. It's a cash 22. And they cannot push him to the corner. And if they keep pushing him to the corner, they will end up with problems. That's why when we talk about all the sanctions and the jokes around the sanctions, because we discussed this in the previous uh, session or previous interview, many of the sanctions basically are just a joke. And if you look at the G7 decision just last week to uh, impose a cap on Russian oil, you can see how, I mean, they really do not want to push him to the corner. Honest, this is a fascinating conversation, and I'm tempted to continue it because I'm fascinated to know whether you really and truly do think this is worse than I think it is. But I want to move on now because there's another topic we didn't get into last time that I really want to cover with you, and that is the pricing of oil in U.S. dollars. And specifically, what I'm talking about is I think a lot of people who are not deeply interested in macroeconomics don't really understand the role of the petrodollar system in perpetuating the U.S. dollar's status as reserve currency. One of the senior ministers in Russia, Sergei Glazyev, has architected a plan to try to persuade the rest of the world to stop using dollars to settle international trade and use other currencies. And they're specifically trying to focus on the trade of oil, because it's the biggest global uh, commodity market in existence. What does all of this mean? Is there a risk that if uh, the rest of the world were to dump the dollar and start pricing oil in other currencies, that that could force the loss of the U.S. dollar as reserve currency or losing that status because the petrodollar system is essentially disabled at that point? The quote you mentioned is very important because notice that it mentioned settlement. It did not say pricing. This point is extremely important. So let me explain the details of this. Oil has been priced in U.S. dollar, is priced currently in U.S. dollar, and will remain priced in U.S. dollar for the foreseeable future. Okay. Does that mean it's going to be settled in dollars? Well, I'll, I will go through that. So, but we have some caveats here we have to go through before we discuss the details of it. First of all, which is back to your point, that we have to distinguish between pricing oil in dollar and getting revenues in non-dollar, which is the settlement you are talking about, such as euro or others. Oil is priced in dollar, but if an oil-producing country wishes, just like Russia or, or others, to receive revenues in yuan or euro or Turkish lira or whatever, they can do so given the prevailing exchange rates. The other caveat that getting revenues in non-dollar have an impact on the role of the dollar as a global reserve currency, but it does not affect, does not affect its dominance. And this is an important, for example, let's say 
if I'm just making up those percentages, if the dollar role in international trade is 80 percent, it might decline to 75 or 70. But that's still dominance. So it will lose ground, but still dominant. And notice that all the countries that are trying to get rid of the dollar are the countries with sanctions. And the question, which is purely academic question, is will countries, when we have free world, no sanctions, will countries willingly pick up another currency for settlement? The other caveat is some people say, since I said oil is priced in dollar and continue, will continue to price in dollar, some people might say, hey, Anas, uh, you are wrong. Uh, oil contracts in Shanghai exchange are priced in yuan. And that contradicts what we have just said. The answer is, yes, there is an exchange where yuan is used to price the oil there. But a careful analysis of the oil pricing in China and after adjusting for timing, exchange rates, and crude quality, prices in yuan in Shanghai exchange are a mirror image of the dollar pricing in Dubai exchange, which means that any way you look at it, the pricing is going to be in dollar no matter what, especially that the U.S. is the largest oil producer in the world, and the U.S. has become one of the largest exporters of oil in the world. So even if countries try to, to create their exchanges, as long as the U.S. is the largest producer and a large exporter, oil will remain priced in dollar no matter what. And to go back to, you, to part of your question on uh, will OPEC or Saudi Arabia ditch the dollar pricing, uh, no. There are many reasons why, and I think the audience will be interested in knowing little history and why they will continue using the dollar. When we moved from the gold standard to a float dollar, the first loser in the world was OPEC and OPEC members because the real value of their oil just declined substantially with the inflation. So OPEC met, OPEC experts met, and they brought in experts from all around the world, and they used the IMF and the World Bank, etc. cetera. So they studied various options to price the oil. That was in 1974, 1975. There are public studies and some secret studies. And after they looked at other currencies, which was, of course, the sterling was one, one choice. The yen was one choice. As you remember, the yen was kind of a good currency one day. They looked at basket of currencies. They looked at pricing it in gold. They looked at the IMF SDR. After looking at all the choices, they decided to stick to the dollar despite the losses. And by the way, OPEC report every month shows a chart in the first section of the report on the losses from using the dollar. So you can look at the losses from inflation and, and the dollar on that chart. Uh, there is a myth here I would like to explain too. People say that there is an agreement between Kissinger, the uh, former head of uh, the State Department or the, uh, of the United States during the Nixon years. Uh, so there were disagreements between Secretary Kissinger and the Saudis, and the CIA was involved, or they made a pact to price oil in dollar. Until today, it's a myth. There is not a single evidence that this happened. No one basically showed any proof, even Kissinger and his memoirs and all the biographies and this stuff. There is nothing. So this is a myth. But my explanation to that is the following. When oil prices quadrupled in 1974, after the embargo and after the production cut, those countries were awash with money, all dollars. But the inflation was very high, real interest rate was very low, and because of nationalization of assets in the oil-producing countries, there was efforts by the West I'm talking about the United States and Europe, to literally freeze the assets of some countries. So there was a risk. If you invest overseas, your assets could be frozen. At the same time, the inflation is eating up your whatever interest you want to, to earn, that nominal interest. So there was no incentive for the Saudis to invest outside, while the Saudi economy was very primitive. Uh, most of the population was nomad at that time. Many of them lived in tents. There were barely any roads. 
I mean, it was a very primitive economy. You cannot invest the money in it. So the only choice left for them was if you bring economists to study this, and there are books written on this and articles at that time, that the best investment is to keep oil in the ground. And by the way, this idea is related to the future energy crisis that you mentioned at the beginning of the show. I will allude to this at the end. So they wanted to cut production because the best investment for them was to keep oil in the ground. Kissinger then went there and told them, look, your fear is that if you invest in the West, you are not going to get a real return. What about this? You invest in Treasury in the United States, and we guarantee you real return, and by law, you cannot confiscate or frozen any assets that invest in treasuries. So the two concerns that the Saudis had were eliminated. So they start putting re recycling the petrodollars. So naturally, since they are re recycling this in the United States, and it is in dollar, and the United States uses dollar, so by default, the dollar was the currency of choice. So it wasn't in part of an agreement to use the dollar. No, it was by default because of that. Okay, so the very popularly held belief is that Saudi Arabia is unable to price its oil in anything other than dollars because the deal was the Saudi uh, royal family kind of gets uh, protection from the U.S. government military in exchange for keeping it priced on oil. You're saying that's 100% myth. There is nothing uh, about changing from dollar to something else that would cause a loss of military support for Saudi Arabia from the United States. Correct. So there are two reasons for that, just to, to reiterate. The first reason is the dollar remains the best choice even without anything. And the second one is the, the idea that the United States guaranteed real returns for them uh, made them recycle in the United States, and that gave power to the dollar. So now I'm going to explain why, because I want to eliminate this myth completely and explain it in a, a kind of a nice way where people understand what's going on. The currency that is used to price oil has three characteristics. Liquidity relative stability, and global acceptance. Why the global acceptance? At that time, and if you look at the 70s, 80s, and part of the 90s, there was nothing but the dollar, period. So regardless of protection and military and all that stuff, there was no other choice to meet those three conditions. I mean, you are talking about $1.6 or $1.7 trillion, the value of oil trade this year. There is no other currency can provide liquidity like the dollar. So it was the dollar hysterically. The euro came in later, but the, the problem here is this. First, the problem of pricing oil in one currency is the same, whatever currency you use. So whether you use the yen or the dollar or the sterling or the euro, etc., you move from your uh, dollar to other currency, you still have the same problems. So moving to another currency is not going to solve your problem. And the problem with the euro is that you have to deal with 28 countries, while with the dollar, it's only one government and one central bank, and that's it. So it is very clear that the, the dollar is still the choice. Just look at Brexit, for example, and its impact on the euro and the crisis that happened there. So why deal with the euro? The dollar is still king in this case. The other choice they had was to price oil in basket of currencies. But a basket does not work. And the reason why, because OPEC members historically are scattered around the world. I say historically because Indonesia built out, but Indonesia was far away on the other side of the world. The Arabs basically are in the Middle East and the, next to the Iranians. And then you have Venezuela and Ecuador in Latin America. And then you have Gabon in, in Nigeria and Western Africa. So they are scattered all around the world. And their trading partners are different. Therefore, a basket of currency will benefit some and hurt the others. So they cannot, there is no way for OPEC members to agree on the content of the basket because whatever content they have, some member is going to be hurt by it. And then, even if they do so and they agree on it, they have to change it every month. And, and the management of it is going to be extremely costly. Anas, I understand all of your arguments for why oil needs to continue to be priced in dollars. 
but I want to run a hypothetical situation by you. Let's suppose that Mohammed bin Salman gets a phone call from Xi Jinping, and maybe it's a conference call and Vladimir Putin's on it. And they say, look, we know, Mohammed, you got you to gotta keep it priced in dollars. We get it. But the thing is that settling it in dollars allows the Americans to meddle with our business and, and you know, impose sanctions and so forth. Let's price it in dollars, but let's settle these dollar payments using some kind of digital currency. Now, that could be a, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, could be the digital yuan, although that obviously introduces some other issues for Saudi Arabia, could be some newly created, uh, maybe Sergei Glaziev is secretly building a, 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 a new digital currency expressly for the purpose of, of settling oil payments. So suppose it's priced in dollars, but the trading partners say, look, we don't want to settle in dollars. We want to get off of dollars as soon as we possibly can into some kind of digital currency that the Americans are not able to tamper with or interfere with our affairs. Is that something we should think about? Uh, okay. Uh, he here are the answers. The first one is, remember the three conditions that I mentioned that if to price oil, you need three conditions. And one of them is the relative stability and the worldwide uh, acceptance and liquidity. The problem is when it comes to Bitcoin or any crypto, they, they don't fit those conditions. So it's not going to work. But the second point, the, the, the first point you mentioned is very interesting because they might say, okay, don't get your revenues uh, in dollar, get them in something else. There are a couple of problems here. The first problem is Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, and the UAE five countries, all of them, their currencies are back to the dollar at certain exchange rate, at a fixed exchange rate, which means that when the dollar goes up, their currencies goes up, their currencies go up, and they benefit from that. Why shoot themselves in the foot by getting rid of the dollar, lowering it, and lowering their currencies? Because their inflation will go up. So they need to debag first, and that will take like structural changes in the economy to do that. I don't think they are willing to do that before 2030. Okay. The second argument I definitely agree with. I'm going to respectfully disagree with the first one because it's pretty easy to hedge that on us. Either side of that transaction, if they want to be assured of payment in dollars, uh, they can settle on a price in dollars and say, we're going to settle it in Bitcoin. And each side of the transaction can hedge their price risk or their, their FX risk by taking on a, a Bitcoin position opposite whatever currency they want, whether it's dollar or something else. No, uh, absolutely. But those guys, they never did uh, use any system of hedging. I mean, beside Mexico, as you know, Russia thought about hedging. But those countries, basically, they thrive. I mean, especially if you are talking about OPEC plus management, you cannot work with hedging if you want to control the market or at least control the edges of the market. So you have literally to dissolve OPEC completely, OPEC plus, and go for a more competitive market to be able to hedge. So that, that's the reply to this. But there are other issues to, uh, to this that the, the trade between Saudi Arabia and China still, yes, it's been growing substantially, but still small. Because the only way the Saudis will benefit from getting revenues in Yuan is to trade with China with the same amount, which means that they have to perfectly manage it to get that exactly the same amount. And to do that, uh, the amount is very small. We are talking about 50 billion. 50 billion while the oil trade is 1.6 trillion. So still the impact is very small in this case. Got it. Let's move on to the comedy segment. Uh, the G7 has proposed a solution to this whole situation. All we need to do is put a price cap on Russian oil. Um, it shocks me that we even need to explain why this won't work, but um, <laughs> will it work? Well, uh, I don't know. Did, did you see the comic that I, I posted, like 20 of them on, on Twitter? I've seen a few of them, and I've seen some from other people. And it's, it's amazing to me that... I mean, and I can't figure out, do you believe that the government officials that are promoting all this, are they really stupid enough to believe their own bullshit? Or are they just saying this to virtue signal because they're telling their constituents what they want to let's, hear? Let's, let's go over this. Let, let, let's go over this because this is kind of very interesting. I mean, you have uh, the, who is spearheading this? Yellen. 
Janet Yellen. And Janet Yellen, as you know, she failed mis miserably when she tried to deal with inflation, although inflation is her specialty. And she failed miserably, and she said, we have no problem, this is transitory, etc., and then blew up in our face and everyone's face completely. And now Janet Yellen is an oil expert. So what do you expect? But let's go through the, those details, Eric, because this is kind of pretty funny. Yeah, well, you and I both understand this really well. So let's go back for the benefit of our listeners. Please explain, is it possible for a price cap to work, yes or no? And if so, or if not, why not? It's not going to work, and I'm going to list some reasons in a very simple way. As we speak, the UK is struggling with imposing price cap on energy prices within the UK. If the UK cannot impose a price cap within their own borders, on their own citizens, how they are going to impose a cap on another country's oil, which is Russia, in an international market. Number two, if the U.S. failed to cap health costs for several decades, how does the Biden administration cap the price of Russian oil, which is completely out of their control? Number three, if the price cap is a good idea and it is workable and it is effective and great, but just name all the description you want about this amazing idea. Why did they give Japan an, ex an exemption? They did give Japan an exemption basically to import oil at the market price from Schalin. Schalin too. Why? That means they know it's not workable. Four, if they think it is doable, why did they officially, officially go back and read their three-page press release, they officially ask OPEC to increase production, which means as if they are saying it will work, but only if OPEC increase production. Number five, they want to monitor every tanker carrying Russian oil. They want every tanker to show a paper of origination, where it came from, where that oil came from, and another paper from a bank now listen to this, from a bank showing the price they paid. It has to be that price they specified or lower. Now that bank could be any bank or could be accredited bank from them. So are they going to hire 87,000 people to monitor and inspect these papers? Notice that I used 87,000. What they are going to do with the violations, if they catch violations, what is the punishment? And And whom they are going to hire to punish, so who, who is going to catch them? Is the U.S. Navy going to go around the world uh, after those guys? What makes this fascinating is this. Who gave the G7 the authority to control world seas and to inspect tankers? They don't have the legal authority to do so. Number six, it is clear from the press release that they want the EU to go ahead with its sanctions on Russia, which means that they are going to ban the uh, imports of oil from Russia at the end of the year, except three countries that are landlocked. But throughout the press release, they mentioned middle-income countries and the benefits to the middle-income countries. And we know there are no middle-income countries in the EU. And the U.S. is not a middle-income country, and Canada is not a middle-income country. So what they mean? They mean literally India and China. But India and China are already getting about $30 discount buying Russian oil, in a sense. And that's what's funny about this. India and China have already capped Russian oil prices long ago. From March, they capped it. Why do they need the G7 price cap? When you're saying they capped it, you're saying that they're just choosing not to add to their reserves or to buy more above a certain price. Well, what I'm saying is, in a sense, Russia and India are buying it, let's say, at $70. It's, it looks like a price cap after the discount. So why they need the G7 to put another cap, and most likely it will be within this range anyway. And yet they have to show papers, they have to go through all the inspections, they have to be delayed. They have, so there is no incentive at all for China and India to go through this. And, and one of the ironies is this is the first G7 meeting we've seen in many, many years where climate change never been mentioned. So to sum up, 
why do they need, why the G7, of course, the G7 was pressured by the Biden administration because the Biden administration want to show something before the election. Why do they need to cap the price of Russian oil? There are only two answers, only two. The first one is because they want to reduce Putin's revenues. Why? Because they couldn't control his oil exports. The irony is, and this is the fact of life, if they cannot control Russian exports, they cannot control the export prices. It's, it's as simple as that. They cannot control export, therefore they cannot control their prices. That shows the decision is political just before the midterm election in the United States. So that's the first one. The second one is, do they need the Russian oil? If they do, that becomes immoral because they are trying to tell the Ukrainians, look, we are standing by you. We are imposing all of this because of Ukraine. We are doing this, 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 this. And all of a sudden, they are telling Putin, sorry, we need your oil, but at a cheaper price. But look at this. When they are saying this, they are telling Putin, sorry, we really, really need your oil. But can you give it to us at the same price that India and, and China are getting? And think about it. What would Putin do? Not only Putin, anyone, any person instead of Putin on the other side. They'll say, you know what? If you need them, like we started the podcast today, if you need it, I'm going to cut supplies. So the end result is it's all in the hand of Putin, like you said earlier, which is going to raise prices farther. Do you believe that the politicians who are proposing this in the G7 sincerely believe that it could work? Or do you think that they just can't think of anything else to say and need to give the public the sense that they're trying to do something? Uh, I think uh, this is my own opinion here, and, and I'm going to, want to focus. It is my personal opinion. I think Yellen knows, but she is forced to say it will work. And we already heard from a couple of ministers in the EU uh, in the last two days saying it will not work. So they know, but they've been pressured. And the reason why I say this, because when they went to the meeting, the only way they can get a resolution is to get a consensus. And the only way they can get consensus basically is to give a kind of uh, uh, agree to certain things that the members ask for, just like Japan when they ask for exemption. So the only way Japan can say yes, if they get the exemption. So it is clear that many members or many officials believe it's, it's not workable. Anas, I want to go back to the subject of production capacity. Now, when we talked about this in the last interview we did, uh, you were very quick to say that the world is definitely starting to run out of spare capacity, but we're not out yet. You know, the Saudis still had a million, million and a half barrels of spare capacity at that point. Uh, it seems to me since we did that interview, uh, OPEC Plus has been consistently underproducing to the tune of about 3 million barrels below their quotas. And furthermore, I think it's fascinating that they, without any explanation, they changed their terminology. So suddenly we don't have production quotas anymore. We have production targets. So it's not a quota. It's a target. Um, then more recently, we just saw a reversal where they had increased their production target or ceiling by 100,000 barrels a day because Biden had pressured them to. They just reversed that at this week's meeting. What does all this mean? Sure sounds to me like the world is completely out of spare capacity. Okay, a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, the difference between the target or the ceiling of production and the actual production has no impact on the market. Uh, because this is kind of an imaginary thing that people just talk about, but it has no actual impact on the market. But it tells you that some countries cannot increase production. And the loss in production basically happened because of political reasons, especially in Libya. Uh, there was a time when we lost about one, one million barrels uh, a day. Uh, we lost about 300,000 barrels a day from Nigeria. And then we lost some Kazakhstan oil, if you recall, in March and April. Uh, so they were lo those losses were completely uh, political, and they have nothing to do with the capacity. We still have the capacity. The issue here is we have little left. And this le little left become so prized that you have to manage it effectively to make the most out of it. I did hear from an official, uh, a Saudi official, about after the uh, recession we had in 2008, uh, 2009, he said never again. And what he, me what he meant by never again was that 
they will never run out of spare capacity because when they ran out of spare capacity in early 2008, the speculators took over. And that was a major, uh, a major problem. So their idea here is I'm going to keep this capacity as long as I can unless I have an emergency where I have to use it for a short term. Do we still have spare capacity? Yes, we do. We can do. We can finish this year and the next three quarters next year without any problems. But after that, once we reach the fourth quarter of 2023, we have a serious problem. To go back to your point about the 100,000 this month and the following month, right now we have the, the, these issues, and I think people should pay attention to this. Last year, two major developments happened in the market, and I think we covered this in the previous podcast. Two major developments happened in the market. The first one that uh, OPEC members, for the first time ever, they refused, especially the large ones with spare capacity, they refused to infringe on the market share of others. This never happened before. Historically, when prices go up and some members cannot cover their quota, the others will come in and cover their quota and increase production. That's why OPEC was a failure for a long time. Now it's a completely different story, and this constitutes a major change in market structure in 2021. Now comes 2022. What are the major events? The first major event is the invasion of Ukraine. The second major event is the use of the SPR, a large quantity by the Biden administration. And the third major event, what we've seen today and in, in the last month too, which is what I call the OPEC three-leg policy. This never happened before. What is the OPEC three-leg uh, three policy? First, OPEC meets at the beginning of the month. They come, or OPEC plus, of course. They come up with, with a decision, whatever that decision is. Don't behave or act based on that decision. That decision is not complete. You wait until you hear the Aramco OSP, the official selling price, because Aramco of, uh, official price can nullify that decision, the OPEC decision a day or two days earlier, or can literally contribute to it. And then you start seeing a direction here. Then the last leg is... What's going to happen to supply? Notice here I said supply, I did not say production because supply could be larger or smaller than production. For example, you might end up with a production and then countries have oil in storage so they can pr produce and export what they produced and then use oil in the storage and export it too. So the total is supply. So this becomes important here. So we got to watch, are they storing oil that means their exports are lower and the supply is lower? Or are they literally diverting oil from domestic consumption because it's the end of the summer, the cooling season is over, and they are going to increase supply, although their production is declining or staying the same? So those are the three legs to the policy. And we got to watch those together as one unit to understand what's going on. And that's why I have this coded tweet last week when I said increase plus increase equal no change or decrease plus decrease uh, equal no change in anticipation of a decrease in, in output and decrease in, in the OSP of Aramco. So that was written a week before the event. So the idea here is we have to look at those three, three things because it's kind of a musical chair where the net of that is no change. Well, Anas, I cannot thank you enough for an absolutely terrific interview. I'm going to resist the temptation to ask you to elaborate on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because I make a policy of not arguing with guests, and I think that conversation might need a referee. I'm not sure. Uh, hold so, on just a second. Hold on. Look, look, look. You, you cannot beat me on that. I, I, I I'm, could I'm easily beat you, you on you that because now. you're missing the whole point. But we're not going to get into debate on macro voices. We'll, We'll save that for a, for a beer sometime. Well, I'm going, to pre I'm going to buy gloves today. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I don't argue with, uh, with guests on, on, on this podcast, so we'll, we'll have to duke it out on, on, on another venue someplace. Maybe I, I know you do a lot of speaking engagements. Maybe we'll be at a conference, and I just hate to show you up in front of your peers. I don't know. 
So we'll save that one for another day on us. But uh, before I let you go, please do tell our listeners, uh, you are one of the most respected public speakers in the entire oil and gas industry. Do you have any upcoming presentations that are open to the public? If so, where and when? For people who are interested in hiring you for uh, private presentations, how do they find out about that? And for people who want to follow your outstanding work, tell us your Twitter handle and how they can follow you. Yes, unfortunately, there are no public events at this time. Uh, all of them are private uh, uh, events. Uh, people can go to my website, which is my name, uh, Anas Alhaji, A-N-A-S-A-L-H-A-J-J-I.com, and there, are a, there is a form there and a section for messages so they can fill out the form, and, and uh, uh, we will receive the request for speaking engagements. And then there are, the, of course, Twitter account and uh, LinkedIn and other things if people want to uh, contact me. I do put a lot of things on Twitter. I just would like to mention at the end here, I do post a lot of things in Arabic. And please note that there is this translation button at the left, at the bottom left of every tweet. So if you see in Arabic, it's some, some, some of them are even breaking news before anyone else in the world. So you can just click on that translate and you get it in the language that your browser is set in. Thank you, Eric, for everything. And I'm looking forward to that uh, SPR fight. <laughs> it's a fight you cannot win, sir, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this. After being completely sold out of advertising space for the last couple of years, we finally have capacity to add a new advertiser. Macro Voices has a PodTrack certified global audience of over 170,000 listeners, and each weekly episode typically gets 60,000 to 80,000 downloads. We have more than 20,000 accredited investors who have registered with us as accredited, and we estimate the total accredited investor audience as at least 40,000 accredited listeners, which we believe to be the highest number of accredited investor listeners of any podcast on the Internet. We strive to accept tasteful advertising from advertisers whose product is likely to appeal to our audience. So we're looking for another investment or financial services advertiser to fill the space I'm speaking in right now. Mail order Viagra salesmen need not apply. If your company wants to advertise on Macro Voices, please email sponsorship at macrovoices.com for more information. Now let's get right back to the show. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Anas back on the show. What did you take away from the interview? I was totally, completely floored when he told me at the beginning that it was worse than even I thought. Uh, frankly, I was really kind of hoping that he was going to set me straight and explain why it's not nearly as bad as I thought. As I mentioned in the market wrap, I've been holding back on some of my own most radical and highest conviction views and opinions because I felt it was irresponsible to share extreme views on a public podcast without doing my homework and checking my facts. Having now had interviews in recent weeks with Adam Rosenschweig, Lee Gehring, and now Dr. Anas Alhaji, I'm going to open up the proverbial kimono and tell you what I really think. But first and most importantly... I want to be super clear that our extremely high conviction for much higher prices before this is over should not be interpreted by anyone as some kind of can't-lose market call. If anything, this is an incredibly challenging trade. The reason is the volatility that I explained in the market wrap. We, we just had this gigantic, uh, you know, 5% down yesterday. Could we have another one of those? Sure. At this kind of thin liquidity, any kind of recession-related news is going to push the market down. Any further news from OPEC Plus suggesting that they're going to defend higher prices is likely to push it very quickly back up. So in this kind of volatility environment, y you can really get clobbered. So it's a, a very difficult market to trade. And I absolutely want to be super clear. This is not some uh, sure thing bet where there's something you can buy that's guaranteed to go up. Moving on, though, my opinion is that the situation we now face will be much, much worse than the global pandemic that we correctly predicted back in 2020. By situation, 
we now face. What I mean by those words is the confluence of the following five factors into what I see as an economical and geopolitical perfect storm. Number one, we're on the cusp of a major global recession. Number two, because of inflation, the old stimulus playbook isn't going to work this time. And most market participants are complacent because they don't understand that inflation totally changes the calculus and ties central bankers' hands. They can't just paper over problems with stimulus because doing so will exacerbate the inflation problem. Number three, the energy crisis is real, it's imminent, and most importantly, there's no way out of it for several years for all of the reasons confirmed by Adam Rosenschweig and now Anas Alhaji in today's interview. Number four, although I'm personally less qualified to assess and vet the food crisis argument because it's not my area of specialty, frankly, Lee Gehring sounded to me like the real deal. If he was even remotely close to right in what he said in his most recent interview, we're headed for a major food, energy, and inflation crisis globally in coming years. And finally, number five, Western policymakers have just handed all the cards to Vladimir Putin. He now has the ability to completely crash the global economy by just temporarily taking his oil off the market. So he could literally shut down the global economy and demand ransom to turn it back on if he wanted to. It was Western policymakers whose backfiring, ill-conceived sanctions handed Putin far more power than he had back on February 24th. Now let's zoom way back out to the really big picture and connect the dots here. All of these topics we're discussing are second, third, and fourth order effects of the real heart of the matter core problem, which scientists have understood for decades, but nobody dares even discuss in public because it's so politically awkward. That core problem is global overpopulation. Experts agree that the planet can sustain a maximum of about 2 billion humans on natural ecosystems without modern agriculture, fertilizers, genetically modified organisms, and so forth. We have 8 billion people, or approximately four times the natural limit of the planet's capacity to host human beings. It is not possible to sustain that population size, never mind let it continue to grow exponentially, given the finite limits of natural resources. Climate change, to whatever extent it's truly anthropogenic, is a second-order effect of global overpopulation. And now the food and fertilizer crisis is being driven by the exact same thing. Between Russia and Ukraine, China and Taiwan, and everything else, I believe that geopolitically speaking, we're closer to escalation to nuclear war right now than at any time during the Cold War, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. Plenty of experts agree with me. Scientists and economists since Thomas Malthus in the early 1800s have understood that an exponentially growing human population would eventually exceed the finite limits of natural resources, which are not growing exponentially, but rather have been slowly depleted for centuries of modern human civilization. But those views have always been dismissed as quackery because the dire predictions that were made at the time never came true for years and years after they were first made. All those guys, from Malthus to Martinson, who said that exponential growth of humanity in a fixed-limit natural resource system were never wrong like everyone thought. They were just way before their time. The energy crisis is fixable, but it will take several years, long enough for resource wars to develop and for the world to change completely. And if you truly fixed it, the food problem is only going to get worse over time. Adolf Hitler's motivations for his attempt to extinguish entire races in favor of making his own the master race were utter lunacy at the time that had absolutely no logical or rational sense behind them. But quite frankly, the cold hard truth is that policymakers globally are looking around and realizing that the planet is running out of energy and food resources and we cannot go back to pre-pandemic normal because of it. Now there's a much more easily palatable justification for New Age, Hitler-like lunatics to decide that they need to kill off the rest of the world in order to keep the remaining natural resources for people who look like themselves. And that's exactly why World War III already began at least two years ago. 
It won't be fought on battlefields with rifles and soldiers and trenches. It's being fought right now on economic and cyber battlefields. And quite frankly, Vladimir Putin has his act together a lot better than Western leaders. I certainly do not endorse his actions, his motives, or his goals. But in terms of his competence to be a bad guy, he's doing a much better job at being a bad guy as our good guys are doing at being good guys. So we've just handed Putin Pretty much all of the cards, thanks to foolish Western policy decisions. I predict that at some point in our lifetimes, and probably well before the present decade is out, we'll get to a Cuban Missile Crisis-like moment where the continued existence of humanity literally depends on whether the heads of state of the United States, Russia, and China all have the ability to end humanity if compromise cannot be reached. In that situation, quite frankly, I'd rather have Kennedy and Khrushchev than the present team in the United States and Russia. And now that Liz Truss is in charge of the UK, folks, we need the A team as heads of state for what I see coming. And we've got the Z team. So my overall prediction is that contention and competition for finite natural resources will be the predominant trend of the next several decades. Now, I think I know how to solve the energy problem with a nuclear renaissance based on thorium rather than uranium-fueled nuclear power plants. But that would take 20 years that we simply do not have, and it still doesn't solve the food problem. So I'm bracing for a world where geopolitical tension continues to escalate around the globe. Civil unrest continues to grow exponentially. Civil wars occur in major developed economy nations, and the world generally just goes to shit. And I don't see any way out of it long term. My conviction on these admittedly extreme things that I'm saying is, frankly, stronger than my conviction was on the February 2020 call that a pandemic was imminent. Now, all of this makes me feel like I could make more money trading what I see coming than I ever could have imagined. But frankly, I barely even care. In the last few months, I've become much more focused on living my personal life as fully and completely as I possibly can. Now, while it's still possible to fly on airliners almost anywhere in the world, enjoy my life, liberty, and freedom. I predict all of these things will slowly, gradually become less and less available and also more expensive in coming years. In a natural resource-centric world war where nations hoard rather than trade natural resources is entirely possible. To be clear, I'm absolutely not making any immediate-term predictions about markets or geopolitics. I have no idea what the next three months will bring, and an oil price crash down to $40 is entirely possible in the face of an oncoming global recession, despite my extreme conviction, longer-term, very bullish views. So I really have no idea what comes next in the sense uh, of weeks and months, but in terms of years... My conviction could not possibly be stronger, that it is simply not possible to make it through the end of the present decade without some major geopolitical and economic fireworks. I fear that the COVID-19 pandemic will be remembered as the easy part of the 2020s before things got really bad. I sincerely hope to be proven dead wrong on every single thing that I've said here. And the last time I said that was when we predicted the COVID pandemic back in January of 2020. Let's all hope that I don't get two disaster calls in a row right, because quite frankly, the world really, really needs me to be wrong about this. On a more positive note, this week's postgame chart deck is titled Current Intermarket Landscape. Patrick, with a lead in like that, let's get the good news on the table. What's going on here? <laughs> all right. Let me, let me see if I can put a positive spin on these charts, Eric. All right. Let, I just uh, wanted to talk quickly about these markets, the S&P 500 I'm on uh, page two. And uh, one of the things on my mind, Eric, is like, in the end, there has been a lot of negative news and the tone of everyone is incredibly bearish. What? I'm and, upbeat and um, positive. The- what are you talking about? No, but you know what? The one thing, though, Eric, is rarely does the market do what everyone expects at the moment they expect it. Like there, and the one thing is that, like, with this market already having declined for two weeks and it hasn't really yet broken, I kind of asked the question: is whether the stock market is prepared to throw a curveball here and uh, and fake everyone out? And it doesn't make it a new bull market, or it doesn't uh, you know mean that there's going to be another like seven hundred point advantage. But, uh, you know, with the midterm elections coming up and everyone expecting a September crash following the 2008 analog, 
I wouldn't be surprised if the stock market here gave a reaction, at least to the upside, to kind of fake everyone out. I'm going to be watching this kind of 4,000 to 4,100 level uh, to watch because if we see that the markets over the, the next couple of trading sessions just keep failing below there, then there is no doubt that a double bottom retest of 3,600 could be on the cards. But uh, this is a, a moment where a bounce, I think, uh, may surprise some people, at least, uh, uh, you know, clear out some uh, of the shorts that are uh, too short term on their time horizons, holding September expiries and things like that. We'll see. It'll be interesting. What, what I wanted to, though, on uh, Eric, look at on page three is the Nikkei. And while the Nikkei has been benefiting from uh, a currency collapse, which is something I'll, I'll talk about in the, uh, in the next few charts, but uh, the Nikkei has generally been one of the stronger equity markets. And uh, we continue to see these wedging formations that are rolling up. It'll be interesting to see whether or not the fact that uh, the currency got kiboshed so badly, whether or not that actually uh, drives the Nikkei to outperform all the other uh, stock markets on a relative basis. It's been holding up much better, and it's certainly on, uh, be interesting to see whether it can make it up to 30000 in this type of environment. Patrick, I just want to chime in and say I agree emphatically with what you just said a minute ago about the possibility of a great big upside surprise. And as much as it probably doesn't sound that way, it's really not at all at odds with what I said earlier. Uh, I think that things are set to get much worse. But as you say, in a market, any time that everybody expects something to happen, it's almost certain that the opposite's going to happen. And so in the short term, I've got no idea what comes next. What I am pretty confident of is uh, this ain't over till it's over. Right. So I, I want to look at page four and five where I have the U.S. dollar and the uh, US, U.S. dollar yen. And uh, the U.S. dollar continues to plug higher. Uh, what is interesting is, is that uh, we have some pretty interesting crossroads right now in the currency markets. I don't have the chart up here, but like when you look at the um, U.S. dollar CAD approaching its uh, uh, previous high, the Australian dollar double bottom testing, the, the pound sterling finishing a measured move to the downside, and, and on page five, you can see the absolute melt up of the U.S. dollar yen, which uh, is actually almost accelerating to a parabolic rise, which is a base, essentially almost a, a collapse of the yen. And so we're seeing some pretty extreme currency moves. And uh, one of the interesting things is the euro is diverging a little bit. At least it's lost its downside momentum. And it'll be really interesting to see whether we're in sort of like the seventh, eighth innings of this current uh, impulse of the dollar. I don't want to imply a major dollar reversal yet, but uh, certainly I think that the conditions in the dollar are overbought enough that it pausing and mean reverting a little bit here could be a thing. And if, if we see that action happen in the currency markets, the, the thought I have is that maybe that is uh, what kind of gives the markets that short-term bullish impulse that may uh, drive a, um, a little risk-on event as the dollar takes a break from this, uh, this crushing advance. Patrick, I agree completely. My view, uh, bullish view, that the dollar rally is set to continue stands. But hey, we just hit what looks to me like a you know a test of the top of the channel. There's plenty of room to come back down to, I don't know, 106 or so. And it's you know not at all breaking the channel. It's all still part of the uptrend. Lots of room for a, a pullback here. What I wanted to look at on page six here, Eric, is uh, looking at gold. But I felt like uh, what I wanted to make the observation, everyone was always uh, benchmarking gold or, or observing gold's trends relative to uh, real yields or negative yield, real yields and all these other types of metrics, which, of course, are an influence on gold. I'm not, not trying to deny it. But really, uh, this year, I think gold can be best defined as its correlation as a cross-currency to that dollar. And what I wanted to just illustrate is I overlaid gold and put on all of the cross currencies. And what you can observe is like the highs and the lows all seem to cluster in the same primary trend. And I think that at this moment, whether or not people are looking at, at gold as an inflation hedge, really what gold continues to prove itself at this moment is simply to being an alternative uh, currency to the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar bullishness is really what arguably has been the drag on gold's performance in this cycle. 
With that said, Eric, let's move on to uh, crude oil futures. And uh, I really wanted to just observe that breakdown candle that happened yesterday that, that broke that support line. You can see through July and August, those lows just above $85 were holding and containing almost all of the short-term lows. And uh, really, uh, this breakdown certainly uh, triggered, I'm sure, uh, some stop outs and, uh, and maybe even some modest uh, margin calls and kind of clean it down. But what's interesting is we're still trading within the FIB zones. And one of the things that I'm going to be watching right here is whether this was a fake out breakdown. And now I'm not trying to make that call yet. But if we see for whatever reason in the next few trading sessions that we're back to $90 and that this was one big fake out, uh, then that will be one, probably one of the bigger tells that maybe um, that a short term low may actually be in crude. I'm not making that call yet, but uh, that's certainly on my mind. Well, that's interesting, Patrick, because I'm thinking about the very same subject, but from a different perspective. You, you as a technician think about it uh, from the, the technical chart. What I'm thinking is, what's the number where OPEC Plus decides it's time to jawbone and defend the market? A lot of people thought $100 Brent was what they were going to defend. We didn't get, at, you know, after this event last night and, and today, early this morning, while Europe was still open, just as the U.S. was opening, that was the perfect time for OPEC if they were going to try to jawbone, you know, we're, to, we're, we're going to consider deeper cuts. We're going to do, you know, whatever it is you want to hear to make you, make you defend the market. Um, when they did that last time, it was an instant trip up by almost 10 bucks. I think that would be the case again. And the question is, when do they take action? A lot of people thought they were going to defend $100 Brent. Doesn't seem they're doing that. Maybe it's $90 Brent. That, that probably makes a lot of sense as a number. I'm not sure. But at some point when OPEC Plus shows the market, okay, this is the floor that we're going to defend, and everybody knows that that's where they're putting uh, the floor in, I think then you have the setup for a, a structural rally to really begin. All right. Well, uh, moving on to page eight, uh, I just have that chart of the RBOB gasoline futures. And what is interesting is while oil's been pulling back, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing the collapse that we've seen in gasoline. I mean, we were uh, trading at almost, uh, f well, we were trading at four and a quarter a gallon, and we're down to two and a quarter, almost a 50% drop in gasoline in the span of three months. And it's led to a huge collapse of, um, of uh, crack spreads and other things like that that uh, really have normalized things in this market. And uh, what I'm curious about is whether or not a short-term low in gasoline futures as we approach this kind of two to two and a quarter level uh, will also correspond with maybe potentially the turn in oil. Uh, certainly, this downtrend has been uh, quite surprising to me how deep it's been. Well, Patrick, I agree. And remember that summer driving season is winding down. And although I think that there will be plenty of continued energy demand, you know, the home construction and that stuff tends to consume more distillates than gasoline. Gasoline really goes into passenger vehicles more than anything else. All right, Eric, on page nine, uh, I wanted to just touch on uh, natural gas prices. And the observation I just simply wanted to make here was uh, what I found was interesting was uh, almost like buy rumors, sell news kind of event that happened around uh, Putin shutting down Nord Stream. This is like even though North American gas is not obviously directly linked to European gas movement, you would think that uh, that would have at least been interpreted as a bullish reaction with, uh, with an uptick, but rather we saw a, a distinct breakdown in that gas prices, uh, breaking uh, that uptrend that's been in place. It'll be uh, really interesting to see what whether or not short-term highs have been established in this nat gas market until we see the natural seasonality of the winter kick in. I'm also perplexed by this one, Patrick. I would have thought that shutting down Nord Stream 1, announcing that it's indefinite, was basically saying that Europe is desperately, desperately, desperately in need of every possible cubic foot of natural gas that it can get from the United States via export. So given that you know reassurance of demand that was already there, why would it suddenly drop then? Uh, maybe our listeners will let us know. I, I am happy to admit that I don't get it on this one. 
Well, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, touch on a page 10 on uranium. And we talked about it the other week, which simply was the fact that uh, uranium had a really strong breakout and really has been following through since. And obviously, Japan firing up its nuclear reactors was the catalyst headline. Uh, it certainly has led to follow through. And that's uh, one of the key things I always say when, when you have a breakout candle like we got back then in August, it was uh, an, an indication of a potential start of a trend move, but I always say that one day doesn't make a new trend. And so we, we wanted to see whether or not it would continue to follow through. But it really seems that uh, as there's new buying attention really continuing to flow toward these uranium plays. It'll be interesting to see whether uh, this trend continues into the end of the year. I think that it should, Patrick, but I'll also offer the caution that this is another real minefield in terms of volatility because uranium is a global market. A lot of it comes from Russia. In fact, uh, the United States used to buy a lot of the uranium for its power plants from downblended Soviet-era nuclear missile warheads. They actually took the, uh, the uranium, super high enriched uranium out of the warheads, downblended it to the appropriate level of enrichment, sold it to the U.S. for the power plants. Uh, obviously, the world is changing. And between Russia, United States, and China, the three major global superpowers, uh, if who's willing to sell stuff to who changes, then the U.S. uranium market could go dramatically up or down overnight almost just on some kind of news about uh, a change in sanctions or a change in, in export rules or something like that. So there's definitely volatility caution here, but I think there's plenty of room for further upside in uranium. Listeners, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. Information is on page 11 and 12 of the chart deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book that we just discussed in the post game, and a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at Research Roundup at macrovoices.com, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. 
Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.